Yeah. Soggy campgrounds, empty beaches. It's July Uary on the south coast also. We were hoping that things would get better, but actually it feels like it's taken a turn for the worse. Fearing for their safety, neighbors demand action in the wake of a vicious attack and... I, I just, I don't want to be alive anymore. Wrestlers allege bullying and harassment in a Vancouver league. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Well, it turned out to be a decent afternoon, but Metro Vancouver certainly hasn't seen the summer weather we're used to. Mm -hmm. Some, including our meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff, are calling this month July Uary. All just another way of saying we haven't seen much sunshine or warm temperatures lately. But as Deborah Goebel tells us, there's good reason to be hopeful about the days ahead. There are expectations that come with the months between June and September, and lately, questions are being asked. Where's our summer? No summer yet. It's not right we've had to wear jackets, hoodies, and sweaters. Even worse, carry umbrellas. Normally we have about 11 and a half days with rain in June. However, this past June, we had 17 days with measurable rain at YBR. Those measurable amounts haven't actually been more rain than we normally get. It's just it spread itself out over six extra cloudy days. And July, well, it's already on track to be more soggy than usual. We've already seen five days of measurable precipitation at YVR, with the average for July, for the whole month of July, being six. These girls are optimistic. They put their swimsuits on underneath, so they still might go <laughs> in the ocean. Seriously, brave go brave girls, yeah. you ready? Are you ready for the ocean? Yeah. Yes, I'm ready. You might think the rest of Canada would be laughing at us for our gloomy days, but a lot of cities are dealing with the opposite problem, heat waves. More than seven days of above 30 degree temperatures in Toronto, while our temperatures have been fairly normal for June in the first part of July. There are upsides if you look for them. You don't have to water the grass. <laughs> God does it for and you. <laughs> and Positive forest side. fire danger right down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Ruthie loves it. It's perfect for her. Uh, it's great for walking. I don't like it because I like to swim outdoors, so I would like it a little hotter. But it's, it's, I would say it's almost ideal dog weather. There's also less crowding on local beaches. And after we get through some weekend showers, who knows? The seasonal outlook for July, August, and September tells us that there's a moderate possibility of above normal temperatures so we may still see some warmth later this summer there is a lot to be said for patience i think we're here to just have a good time we'll make the best of it right guys yeah, yeah. deborah goble cbc news west vancouver ideal dog weather they say yes, yes. all right so meteorologist brett Soderholm home have been, has been watching july uary very closely mm -hmm. so what are some of the additional benefits we heard some of them that uh, deb mentioned what are some of the additional benefits we're looking at with this wet cool weather yeah well absolutely i mean the best one i think that comes to mind of course is talking about our fire danger rating as one of those we just heard from mentioned this but you can see that province-wide today being july 10th there are few spots that are above moderate most of the province right now sitting at a low to a very very low rating and this is just fantastic news but it is a little bit unusual when you compare it to just last year or even the historical normal. I want to show you a couple of graphics that have been put together here to give you an idea of the number of wildfires and how much area has burnt so far in 2020. So we're looking at just shy of 200 wildfires and 673 hectares have been burnt but compare this to last year July 10th 2019 there were 530 fires already and look at this difference close to 12 thousand hectares had been burnt by that point. Now, when you look at this from a perspective of a historical average, again, only 199 now. I'm going to show you in the past five years, usually by this time, we would have 573. And for the 10, 15 years, all in that 400 to 600 range. So we have a lot to be grateful for right here. And these trends in terms of these relatively unsettled conditions are going to be continuing. But of course, if we think back to April, when you look back to the Squamish wildfire that were taking all of us, capturing our imagination and kind of just 
wondering, is this how it's going to be playing out? There is now some good indication that things are going to be calming down. We are looking at a fairly average season right now, according to the BC Wildfire Service. And of course, it does come down to how much lightning we're going to be seeing over July and August. So memories, of course, of that in April probably burned into people's minds, and we're going to be needing to see how it goes from there. Now, in terms of uh, the fire danger rating, I was going to show you that we're still looking at improving conditions over the next little while. And if we look a little bit closer to home temperatures right now, just to show you right where they should be and around that low 20 degree mark. But I'm doing this especially for Mike. I'm going to show the satellite and radar imagery. And look at that. There's some little green blobs over there. And I'm going to tell you what that means and how it relates to our whole forecast across Vancouver and the whole province when I come back. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Fred. We're going to hope those uh, thunderstorm cells stay away, right? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Residents in a downtown Vancouver neighborhood say violence and drug use is getting worse lately in their area. As Andrea Ross reports tonight, after a woman was sucker punched in the Main Street SkyTrain station, neighbors are calling on police and the city to do more. And a warning, some of the video you'll see is disturbing. I actually do feel frightened when I leave my front door. Main Street and Terminal Avenue has changed a lot since Patricia Chartrand moved to the area 20 years ago. Lately, she doesn't feel safe in her neighborhood. On a regular basis, it's very normal to see people who are doing drugs. It's very normal to see people with mental health issues. It's normal to, to see excrement smeared everywhere. She's one of several residents in this area who say drug use, homelessness and violent incidents are on the rise. Two months ago, just around the corner from her apartment, a black woman was viciously assaulted. She was walking into the Main Street SkyTrain station when a man came up and punched her in the back of the head. Transit police say an investigation has been completed. Charges are pending against the man and physically the woman is doing okay. Some residents who have complained about drug use, vandalism and violence say not enough is being done. We make a complaint to the city almost every day, either with the app or we call. And often we've been told that you live in the east side. Like, what do you expect? There are places that are worse than yours. In a statement, police say they have not seen an increase in calls for service to the area. But yesterday, they said they have stepped up patrols. We do have additional resources and officers working that area. Uh, we have had this since COVID started. In a statement, the city said closures of public facilities because of COVID-19 means there are fewer places for people to go if they're experiencing homelessness. It says it's continuing to work with BC Housing on finding more short and long-term solutions. But yeah. these residents want action now. I think we need a comprehensive plan and I keep waiting for the city to stand up and say, this is how we're going to deal with your problem. Until then, they're dealing with it themselves. Residents here say these fences are just a temporary solution to much bigger problems and that it'll take more than a fence to address issues like mental health problems, addiction and homelessness. And they want the city to take that more seriously. Andrea Ross, CBC News, Vancouver. And as we first told you last night, a woman was found dead after a fire engulfed a downtown Vancouver apartment suite. Now police are saying the 65 year old woman died before the fire broke out. Firefighters arrived at 133 West Pender Street shortly after 7 p.m. last night to find one suite surrounded by smoke and flames on the eighth floor. The fire was put out before spreading to other apartments. While alarms did go off, residents have told CBC that alarms in the building go off so often, people sometimes ignore them. Many residents are seniors or have disabilities with limited mobility. Investigators are still working to determine the cause of the woman's death and the root cause of the fire. And before we get to the latest numbers on COVID-19 in BC, a major warning tonight, Interior Health is raising concerns about a possible large-scale exposure to COVID-19 in Kelowna. Officials say several people who attended gatherings and went to restaurants and bars in the downtown area and the waterfront from June 25th to July 6th have tested positive. Eight people exposed in these areas have detected so far with two of them from that region. The rest are from B.C. Interior Health says of specific concern are larger Canada Day and holiday weekend events. And the latest numbers across the province are also of some concern. Sadly, there's been another death bringing B.C.'s total to 187. There were also 25 new confirmed cases today, the highest daily number since B.C now has 100. 
87 active cases, and that's the most since uh, May. Hospitalizations are now at 16, but there has been another person moved to intensive and critical care, bringing the total to five. The jobless rate in our province is down to 13% as our economy rebounds. The latest employment information captures data from June 14th to the 20th. According to that data, unemployment slipped by 0.4% in June after rising for three straight months. The province has continued to lift restrictions in place to slow the spread of COVID-19, allowing more businesses to reopen. BC's Finance Minister Carol James says the gains in employment seen in May and June bring back around 40% of the total job losses since February. I think there's no question that this is related to the challenges of, uh, of the service sector industry, of the challenges of the tourism industry, the challenges of not having international visitors. You would now, by now in Vancouver and in Victoria, be seeing cruise ships coming in. You would be seeing passengers uh, unload. You would be seeing people through the downtown core. So far, the total net job losses as a result of the pandemic are around 235,000. The Vancouver Park Board is considering a bylaw that would allow overnight camping in some city parks. The move comes amid a growing homeless encampment inside Strathcona Park. But as John Hernandez reports, some campers say the rules could do more harm than good. It's the latest tent city in Vancouver, and like many residents here, AJ Mack has no plans on leaving. It's very safe. You know, it's so safe here. You know, we go to town, you know, we take our wallets and stuff, but we leave all our stuff here out like this, no one touches it. Campers have trickled into Strathcona Park since the forced closures of encampments at Oppenheimer and Crab Parks. There's now more than 200 tents here, a number that grows almost daily. We have nurses that are here on a daily basis, sometimes upwards to three times a day. We have acupuncturists, we have a community kitchen. As the demand for shelter swells, the Vancouver Park Board is considering a bylaw that would make it legal for campers to stay here overnight. The move follows a BC Supreme Court decision declaring that homeless residents have a right to shelter. It'll be uh, some basic rough rule that people can uh, set up tents at dusk or maybe 8 o'clock and, uh, and then they, they take their tents down in the morning and, uh, and move, move on. It's a bylaw shift that's been on the board's radar for months. Similar measures have taken effect in cities like Victoria, but campers here aren't sold. Uh, no, I wouldn't like that because A, look how long it took me to do all this. You think I want to do this every day? No. Advocates say there's been little consultation and daily camp teardowns would be disruptive. So it doesn't really necessarily improve um, the the, the lives or, or um, the ability of people to stay in certain places because they're still being displaced at 7 a.m., which in the winter would actually still be very, very dark. I think it's completely unreasonable, inhumane, and definitely not my reconciliation. The board trying to balance a homelessness crisis with public recreation, but even some of its members will admit the only real solution is finding permanent homes. I think if we really want to keep our society healthy and probably more fiscally sound, we want to start uh, housing as many people as possible. The Park Board will vote on the new bylaw on Monday. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Professional wrestling is going through its own version of the Me Too movement. Wrestlers all over the world are using the hashtag speaking out to share stories of sexual harassment, abuse and bullying. As Jesse Johnson reports, several wrestlers have quit a Vancouver's elite Canadian championship wrestling since the movement started last month. Harmony Cowan never outgrew her love for wrestling. She went to her first live event sometime around 2007 and knew she had to get in the ring. I was hooked. <laughs> I'm like, I have to do this. And I think that night I messaged the owners and asked if I could she started training with ECCW, loving it at first, but then, she alleges, the bullying started. I went outside and I was immediately pelted by eggs. And then other trainees that I trained with were told to grab me and I kept getting pelted with eggs. And I had to sit there and laugh it off. 
She left for another promotion in 2008, and later, at a show in Washington State, she alleges people in the crowd took unflattering pictures of her and posted them online where they were mocked. I, I just, I didn't want to be alive anymore. And that's a horrible feeling. Emma Power, who trained with ECCW, alleges she was told to wear shorter shorts during a show last year. When she complained, she says one of the owners held a locker room meeting where the subject of her complaint was allowed to speak. Like basically gave him the opportunity to address the situation and say, essentially, I'm sorry you feel that. Company owner Scott Schnur, who wrestles under the name Scotty Mack, says the person Power complained about was removed from ECCW and he shouldn't have been allowed to speak at the meeting. He says Harmony Cowan's story happened before he became an owner, but he condemns the alleged behavior. So that's the most important thing for me is to give Owner Jeff details. Duncan has also been removed from the ownership group since the Speaking Out movement started. In a statement, he says, after extensive self-reflection, it's clear that I must change my behavior and strive to be a better person. Cowan hopes the speaking out movement cleans up the industry, and if it does, she says she'd be willing to get back in the ring, because after everything, she still loves wrestling. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, thanks to the uh, two women for speaking out about that. And thanks to Jesse for that story. All right, a reminder, you can watch this newscast live on the free CBC Gem app. Yes, and CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. And you can follow both of us on Instagram and Twitter as well. Well, it's just not summer in Vancouver without a trip to the amusement park. And now, after an uncertain beginning to the season, thanks to COVID-19, Playland has reopened. <laughs> Yes, Playland opened their doors to guests today with limited rides and attractions. This weekend, we'll see 12 of their more family-friendly rides up and running. And unfortunately, no, no wooden coaster. It's part of their plan, though, to gradually increase the number of rides available throughout the summer, all while working with health authorities to ensure safety protocols are followed. Anyone planning a visit will have to pre-order admissions passes online for specific dates and times. Masks are also mandatory, but a souvenir Playland face mask is included with paid admission. Our calls tonight for a criminal investigation into the Prime Minister over the WE charity deal. Coming up, why the opposition Conservatives say it's not just a conflict of interest. Well, thanks for watching our ad-free live stream. Well, for better or worse, much of the country is opening up to domestic tourism. In Quebec, Ile de Arlene's is welcoming flocks of tourists. And business owners say despite the pandemic, their shops are bustling. Hi, my name is Marimo de Chevrier. I'm a tourist advisor at Ile d'Orléans. We are more than uh, 100 uh, tourist places on Ile d'Orléans. People who come here fall in love with the place. Yeah, that's a beautiful place, yes. Eating strawberry. <laughs> corner of the, uh, the Vignoble Saint-Pierre. You are more than welcome uh, on uh, Lille d'Orléans. We come from Montreal. We come from the, the center of the city, so just to come out of this, the, the peacefulness here, that's what we're looking for. 
here. There's so much more space here. It's easier to respect uh, the distance. People seem to be, uh, yeah, I don't know, I guess peaceful, quiet, looking around, very, uh, very calm, very different than in the city. Because it's close to Quebec City and it's nice. <laughs> Come and see us, we will be happy to welcome you. Looks like a beautiful place to be. Lovely spot, I've never been there. Me neither. I'm close, but that's uh, maybe in the fall. I mean, not this fall because who's going to be traveling, but uh, it's probably a nice place to be uh, in September, October. Yeah. Changing colors and all that. Totally. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, stay right here. We're going to be back in just a matter of seconds with what's making headlines across the country. Uh, stay with us. The COVID-19 pandemic pushed Canada to record high unemployment in May. But now we're seeing a bit of growth in the economy in our country. Nearly one million more people were working in June. As Jacqueline Hansen tells us, some of the hardest hit industries like hospitality are finding it hard to bounce back. When the pandemic hit, hotels like this one cleared out. We literally just watched our business walk out the door. Occupancy fell as low as 3% which is just a couple of rooms a night. This is unheard of in the industry. The CEO was forced to close a few other locations and lay off staff, but as of June 1st, reopened and started rehiring. Occupancy is picking up, though it's still far below normal. So the company is relying on the federal wage subsidy to help pay workers. If that goes away, I, I do fear that we would have to start to reevaluate our hotels for sure. The accommodation and food services sector now has two-thirds of the jobs it did in February. Still, that lags behind the recovery of other sectors. New graduate Madeline Lemieux worries about searching for a job in tourism alongside industry veterans. They have been there for 15 years and they've been let go of their jobs. And then there's me who's been out of school for a whole month now. Obviously, that's big competition. For now, she feels lucky. She has a 10-week position funded by the Canada Summer Jobs Program. It's part of a shift from urgent relief like the CERB to support that helps restart the economy. As people are returning to work, I think we will see more uptake on that wage subsidy. Almost 2 million people who lost their jobs because of the pandemic are still out of work. And overall, women aren't recovering jobs as quickly as men. Where female are more dominant in terms of labor. Um, it is food and accommodation services, it is tourism, um, it is retail trade, and those industries, because of physical distancing, are really lagging. The more male-dominated industries like construction and manufacturing. The recovery of hospitality is further limited by travel restrictions, especially at the U.S. border. I feel like we're at the mercy sort of of both governments, and they have to do what's safe. Still optimistic that at least the worst is over. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. The Prime Minister is facing new questions tonight for an apparent conflict of interest. Now the opposition is calling for a criminal investigation. It all has to do with a federal grant given to the WE charity and revelations that members of the Trudeau family were paid for appearances at rallies. As David Cochran tells us, the federal finance minister has also been shown to have links to the group now. They've already called in the ethics commissioner. Now the conservatives say it's time to call in the police. On the question of if it's criminal, that's for the RCMP uh, to decide. On whether it's stupid, I think that, that uh, you know, Canadians have, have said that this is ridiculous on its face. Stupid is how many liberals are privately describing this. Dismayed that after being cited for ethical violations twice before, the prime minister could be facing a hat trick. From an improper vacation on the Aga Khan's island to improper meddling in SNC-Lavalin to now playing a direct role in awarding a contract 
to a charity that made direct deposits to direct family members. I want Prime Minister Trudeau and the Liberal cabinet to waive all confidentiality, disclose everything that happened around this, because there are just far too many questions that are unanswered. Now revealed another direct tie between cabinet and the WE organization. Finance Minister Bill Morneau's daughter is an employee of the charity. Like the Prime Minister, Morneau did not recuse himself from the decision to hand the grants program over to WE. As you know, we get advice from our non-partisan government public service. Uh, we took that recommendation. Cabinet ministers stuck to talking points when asked about the controversy and whether they knew the Trudeau family had been paid. With respects to the contract that you're alluding to, uh, any discussions that take place in cabinet, as you're fully aware of, are subject to cabinet confidentiality. There was nothing new from the prime minister or his office. Justin Trudeau had no public events, no availability to take questions, of which there are many. Well, CBC's David Cochran reporting tonight. Well, the Supreme Court of Canada has upheld a law that aims to protect the genetic privacy of Canadians. But as Olivia Stefanovic reports, the legislation has faced multiple hurdles since it was introduced three years ago, even from the federal government itself. The ruling wasn't unanimous, but with a 5-4 to four decision, the scales of justice tipped in favor of upholding the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, a federal law that faced hurdles from within the government, even though it was introduced by a Liberal senator. I'm relieved and delighted. I think that uh, uh, it's a great day for Canadians who are concerned about uh, the protection of their genetic information. The Attorney General in 2017 questioned the legislation's constitutionality and said it should be referred to the talk court. The government of Quebec put the question to the province's Court of Appeal, which unanimously found it to be unconstitutional since it deals with matters that are within provincial and territorial jurisdiction. The Canadian Coalition of Genetic Fairness appealed the ruling. I'm saddened that Quebec does not agree with the constitutionality of that, but in the end, the Supreme Court of Canada does. The majority of justices agreed the law is within Parliament's powers, preventing Canadians from being forced to take genetic tests or provide the results to third parties, such as employers or insurance companies, as a condition of coverage. People in Canada never again have to live in fear on how their genetic information could one day be used against them. It's also a victory for liberal backbenchers who defied their government to pass the bill. I hope that the lesson is, is twofold. One is to, uh, to use cautiously, but to not be afraid to use the, uh, the powers of the federal government uh, to do good. And the second thing is uh, for government to, uh, to, as always, respect parliamentarians. If the law was struck down, legislators feared it would have created a patchwork of protections, leaving Canadians vulnerable. But the High Court's decision leaves a nationwide ban on genetic discrimination in place, the cost of breaking the rules up to $1 million or five years behind bars. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Ottawa. After much backlash, a South Asian dating website has removed a skin tone filter from its search options. Coming up, we'll introduce you to the Canadian woman who helps make it happen. With Peter Mansbridge. One crewman was killed today when a Greenpeace ship exploded in the harbor of Auckland, New Zealand. A spokesman for the environmentalist group says the destruction of the Rainbow Warrior may have been sabotage. Two powerful explosions ripped through the vessel as it docked at a wharf in Auckland. I was on the bridge of the, the MV Explorer and the whole boat was lifted approximately 12 or 18 inches physically away from the wharf and then thrown back onto the wharf and that was followed within 10 seconds with another explosion. Most crew members were rescued but one was trapped in the boat. His body was later recovered by divers.
France has launched an investigation to see if there was an official French connection with last month's sinking of a Greenpeace protest ship. Two French magazines say there was. The Rainbow Warrior was on its way to the French nuclear test zone in the South Pacific when it blew up in New Zealand, killing one man. Terry Molesky reports. In France today, L'Affaire Greenpeace has plunged the nation into a full-blown security scandal. The key revelation, which is not denied by the government, concerns the two French-speaking suspects arrested after the Rainbow Warrior bombing. Sophie and Alain Turange, it is said, are serving officers of the French Foreign Spy Agency. Sophie, allegedly, a captain. Two people now in jail in New Zealand are French officers. The reporter who broke the story insists it's the real thing. I have four, five um, sources of information different that they confirm that. The revelation has rocked the nation and the government is pledged not to cover it up. But ever since the Rainbow Warrior went down with the loss of one crewman's life, fingers have been pointed at the French. The Greenpeace flagship was on a mission to protest French nuclear testing. That takes place here at Mururoa Atoll in the South Pacific. And French nuclear operations in the region are sensitive both militarily and politically. They're run directly by the French Defense Minister Charles Ernu, who also happens to run the Foreign Spy Agency. That agency is being linked now to a mystery yacht which was chartered as a backup up to the bombing mission. The yacht has just disappeared, apparently sunk after the bombing, but the man who charted it turns out to be a doctor from Dieppe with right-wing connections, including the Paris headquarters of the spy agency, which has a long history of dirty tricks. Add to all that, the evidence of life jackets and equipment found at the scene made for the French forces. Both Greenpeace and the New Zealanders are being very tactful about all this and giving the French some time. Prime Minister Longy is stressing that nothing has been proved as yet. However, in Paris tonight, there is already talk that two senior security officials will be forced to resign. And the question here now is not if there was a French connection, but whether it was official or unofficial or something in between. Terry Malevsky, CBC News, Paris. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Well, it hasn't exactly been the warmest summer yet, so we're still waiting. And apparently we'll have to wait a little longer here on the South Coast. July, you area, as some are calling it, has been chilly and wet, campgrounds soggy, beaches empty. Even going for a walk means bundling up. We'll find out if summer might be around the corner in the forecast coming up. So as much as the video itself was shocking, the actual act or the fact that it happened did not shock me. This vicious, unprovoked attack at Main Street SkyTrain Station is just one example of growing safety problems in the area, say neighbours. They say drug use, vandalism and violence have increased since the pandemic and they want the city and police to take action now. Health, interior health is raising concerns about a possible large-scale exposure to COVID-19 in Kelowna. Officials say several people who attended gatherings and went to restaurants and bars downtown and in the waterfront area from June 25th to July 6th have tested positive. Eight people exposed in those areas have been detected so far with two of them from that region. The rest are from BC. Health officials also reporting 25 more cases of COVID-19 within the last 24 hours. That's the biggest increase in our province since May 8th. There's also been one new death. A popular South Asian matchmaking site used all over the world has removed a skin tone filter from its search options, thanks in part to the lobbying of a Canadian. Megan Nagpal was part of a group that pushed Shafi.com to remove the filter, which they called discriminatory and offensive. As far Morali tells us, it's a filter that ties into a historical view among South Asians that light skin is more beautiful. Baby. It's an app that advertises itself as a place to meet someone for keeps. Shadi literally means marriage in Hindi. Megan Nagpal used to have an account until she kept coming across something troubling, a skin tone filter. It has you select whether you are uh, light-skinned, fair, uh, what they call uh, weedish, would be somewhere between light and dark or dark. And users can filter out uh, the skin tone based on their preference of what um, skin tone they want. So Nagpal mobilized. She started tweeting at Shadi.com and joined a group that launched this petition to remove the skin tone filter. The company 
listened. She was able to get the petition directly to the executives of the website and overnight the filter was gone. You know you've become really beautiful, your face is fairer, glowing. For decades, skin lightening creams like Fair and Lovely have been a massive industry in places like India because lighter skin is historically seen as more desirable. That bias is called shadism, also known as colorism, prevalent in the South Asian community. The root of it is slavery. The root of it is also colonization. When a group has been historically oppressed and they have not been given the freedom to understand what their own identity is, uh, something like colorism is very easy to fester in communities because we don't know what makes us enough. Many are now pushing to change perceptions. Marusha Yogaraja was part of a photography project called Unfair and Lovely. It's now a social media movement trying to undo the antiquated notion that light equals beautiful. I do believe that there is some form of empowerment that's happening with darker skinned girls. Um, I don't necessarily know if that's happening with folks who are elders. I have a really hard time having those conversations and because it's so deeply embedded in anti-blackness. While there's plenty of work to do, momentum is building. Though still a lightning cream, Fair and Lovely recently rebranded to Glow and Lovely. And Nagpal says two other South Asian dating sites have also agreed to remove similar filters. If change is happening in the States um, in regards to equality between black people and white people, I would hope that in the South Asian culture, change would also be facilitated as a result of this movement. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. You may recall last month on June 2nd, Instagram posts were full of black squares with the hashtag Blackout Tuesday. One of the purposes of the social media campaign was to amplify black voices, but there was a backlash as many companies who took part were called out for their hypocrisy. One of those companies was Denise Elliott Studios, a hair and makeup company. Back in 2017, Susie Monyo was looking to book the studio for her wedding. Here's her story. But now that I've emailed again <laughs> with a white name, um, all of a sudden there's availability. I took a look at the Instagram and I wasn't actually able to find any pictures of uh, black women. So are you able to send me maybe some from your portfolio um, just so that I can get a look? And if not, uh, do you offer trial consultations? At that point, I got a response back pretty quickly, I'd say, like within the next day or so that said, sorry, we're actually not available May 20th, 2018. Good luck with your search. So I created a fake email um, under the name Becky Carlisle, and uh, I got a response that said, thank you so much for reaching out. We're available on your date. So I was quite disappointed at, at the response. Um, then I just let her know that, hey, actually, you've been talking to Susie the whole time, and I emailed you two weeks ago. Someone I know had uh, DM'd me the uh, Blackout Tuesday post that said, muted, listening, and learning. And when I saw it, I just got a flood of emotions come back to me. I just felt like it was quite trivial and and it lacked accountability. I'm just disappointed that it took, you know, what some might call public shaming for them to take accountability and make those changes because this situation happened three years ago and to my knowledge they did not hire any black makeup artists or um, really make an attempt at increasing or or being more inclusive of, of black brides in their company. Another day, another grim record smashed. For the first time, the U.S. infection rate for COVID-19 passes 60,000 and death rates on the rise too. The latest coming up. And it's 6.38 p.m. That is the uh, live tower cam from the top of Grouse Mountain looking out toward the city. Beautiful night. The weekend is here, but will it resemble anything like summer? That's the big question. Brett will have our forecasts after the break.
when your backyard is burning is anywhere safe. I'm Adrian Lamb, the host of a new podcast, World on Fire. Join us on the front lines of wildfires burning around the world. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. All right, meteorologist Brett Soderholm joins us in for Johanna Wagstaff tonight. Are you here because uh, Saturday is looming and you wanted to keep your... <laughs> you know what, Mike? That's exactly why I'm here. I just knew how much you wanted to hear about rain in the forecast for Saturday, and I wanted to keep the tradition alive. I mean, it was a bonding experience, really. Oh and God. so I think here in Vancouver, yeah, you know the story by now. If you've been following along, here's how this weekend is going to be playing out. So for this evening, getting into the overnight period, it will still be dry. We're looking at just a few clouds. Low temperatures only going down to 13, which is seasonal. But yes, here is Saturday. Now this icon here, it's a bit misleading. It may look like it's going to be raining all day. That is not the case. When you wake up first thing in the morning, it'll likely be cloudy, but the rain is going to be coming in sort of into that mid to late afternoon hour, and it's not going to be lasting all day. By the evening, it will start to clear out once again, and that will leave us for Sunday. Lots of sunshine in the forecast and temperatures right where they should be. So here's a look at how that's all going to be playing out. I mentioned this increase in cloud cover as we go through tomorrow and there, right between two and four o'clock, we'll get a little wave of moisture coming through but then it's going to be clearing out throughout the evening and by the time Sunday rolls around there's not going to be much to be worrying about at all. If you're wondering where it's coming from though you can take some solace knowing that most areas of BC are all going to be in this together. This area of low pressure bringing moisture from the Pacific Ocean widespread across the province. The only exception if you're in the Kootenays or going to say the Okanagan this weekend likely to still be quite hot and dry on Saturday before the rain makes its way over there comes Sunday and then in reverse we're going to be clearing up on Sunday and setting up for a nice dry trend as usual to start off next week. Now in terms of rainfall totals here, I also want to stress we're not looking at a significant amount for here in Vancouver, but for northern portions of Vancouver Island, in addition to our central coast, including Bella Bella, there's the potential for over 75 millimeters to accumulate this weekend, but closer in town, I'd honestly be surprised if we get more than five millimeters. So there is not going to be a lot, but just enough to keep things on the cool side. And look at this temperature divide. Well, Vancouver, Abbotsford around 19 degrees on Saturday, but so we use 31, Kelowna 27 on Saturday, and then we're going to cool down a little bit in the interior come Sunday. And farther to the north, very similar trend. We're just going to be seeing temperatures behaving fairly close to where they should be, though a little bit cooler toward Prince George. And as a five-day forecast, I'll leave you with this. Yeah, nice little balance here because we're going to get some of those showers for Saturday. But Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, we're looking like we're going through a little bit of a dry stretch and temperatures right where they should be. 2021, 20, it is going to be feeling pretty nice. No humidity to speak of, a nice nice little breeze i think it'll be feeling a little bit more summer like by the time we get to next week oh, very good little redemption there for you thank you <laughs> thanks brett well, the covid 19 situation in the u.s seems to be moving tonight from bad to worse today alone it registered nearly 60,000 new cases yet another record high just months ago, New York was among the worst hit. This is what the state's curve looked like from mid-March to mid-April. Thousands of deaths followed. Now, look at Texas over the past month. And then here's Florida, two major hot spots. Epidemiologists fear they've seen this movie before. But as Salima Shivji shows us, the U.S. president seems to be watching something else. His poll numbers. A busy day for the president. A lot of very good stuff, so we look forward to it. Heading to Miami-Dade County, the heart of the virus's Florida epicenter. Flirting with infection records daily, dozens of hospitals at capacity. Back in April, and this is now. This is how many admissions that we're having to our hospitals. The lines to get tested, impossibly long. And in this part of the state, more than 33% are coming back positive compounding the problem at ICU after ICU. When you lose a 49-year-old who came in, told the nurse on day one, I don't think I'm leaving this hospital, and he was right. In all honesty, we don't feel like we're moving anywhere positive in the right direction. Very grateful also to be But that's not the president's message while courting Florida's all-important Latino vote, which is downplaying the virus. We're still fighting it, and uh, we're going to do very well. We're testing at, at a level that nobody's ever tested before. Oh, Korea, if you'd stand up. Or at a visit to talk up drug enforcement, trying to change the subject entirely. We're setting records on jobs. We're setting records on many different things. 
but it's impossible to avoid. Greeted by masks at every turn, not wearing one himself, directly contradicting the advice of his own health officials. We really believe that the uniform use of masks in all metros and in all areas with rising new infections, particularly counties and metros with over 5% positivity. The pandemic is seeping into the president's plans, despite his best efforts. Plans for a weekend campaign rally in New Hampshire nixed officially because of the weather. But amid concerns, a storm of new infections could follow in one of the few states where the spread of the virus is still stable. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Washington. And a late development to tell you about tonight. The U.S. president has commuted the sentence of his longtime friend and advisor Roger Stone. It comes just days before Stone was due to report to prison. He had been sentenced in February for crimes related to the Russia investigation. The White House says Stone was a victim of the Russia hoax. Meanwhile, the Democrats denounced Trump's intervention, calling it offensive to the rule of law. And according to the World Health Organization, today marked a new record with more than 228,000 new COVID-19 cases worldwide. The WHO has also launched a probe looking into the pandemic's origins. One of the big issues is to, to, to look at whether or not this, it jumped from species to a, a human and what species it jumped from. An advanced team is headed to China to organize investigations. Scientists believe COVID-19 emerged in nature before it began infecting humans at a market in Wuhan late last year. Well, it's official after shutting down because of COVID-19. The National Hockey League is setting up shop again in Canada. Toronto and Edmonton are officially the hub cities with games beginning August 1st. Along with the plan to hit the ice comes health and safety rules. Teams will have a maximum of 52 people in their secure group, including a dedicated health compliance officer and a maximum of 31 players. Training camps open Monday in each team's home market. Our Vancouver Canucks will hit the ice August 2nd in Edmonton against the Minnesota Wild. The United Nations has started to investigate the disease link between animals and people. As Margaret Evans reports, wildlife advocates say protecting the health of nature will help protect us. The face of a pandemic repeating across the globe and destined to do so again and again unless humankind rescues its relationship with the natural world. That's the warning from authors of a UN report this week on zoonotic diseases, the ones that can jump between animals and humans, things like SARS, Ebola, and COVID-19. For these new diseases which are emerging at the interface of people, of wildlife, of domestic animals, of degraded environments, I think we need more and better coordination. 75% of emerging infectious diseases come from animals, according to the report. And the more we exploit them and destroy ecosystems, it says, the more there will be. It urges a one health approach, human, animal, and environmental, to stop the next one. Veterinarian Gladys Kalema Zikusoka is an early advocate. She founded an NGO in Uganda called Conservation Through Public Health, as much to protect the great apes from humans as the other way around. You know, because we share over 98% genetic material and can make each other sick, it's very likely we can easily make these great apes sick. She also believes curbing the illegal wildlife trade is key. Over-exploitation, going into the wild to pick animals, deforestation, habitat degradation brings us closer and closer to wildlife in a way that it shouldn't be. Other factors mentioned include population growth, a rise in mass and unsustainable farming, and climate change. Conservationists caution against treating COVID-19 as a health issue alone. I do wish also that it will be taken as an environment issue, because that's the way you can deal with this in the long term. Another message, no country can afford to turn a blind eye. It's a problem that can come to Canada, even if it's not made in Canada. A sad truth, perhaps, that it might take a threat to humankind to save the species we share the planet with. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. It is an illustrious title, a UNESCO global geopark. So what does that mean? 
And what makes this place in Nova Scotia so special? Find out next. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. What's gender identity? What does non-binary mean? Subscribe to CBC BC's new podcast, They and Us, and join host Will Fendel as they explore these questions and more. And never miss a special programming series or contest. Subscribe to CBC Vancouver's e-newsletter at cbc.ca slash Vancouver inbox and keep connected with us. The cliffs of Fundy in Nova Scotia have been designated a UNESCO Global Geopark. And as Emma Davies reports, it's a much needed boost for people in that area. Let's get inside. Whoa! These visitors are taking a tour of the cliffs of Fundy at Five Islands Provincial Park. Part of the newly designated UNESCO Global Geopark, the area is rich with geological history. So when we're finding something that nobody's ever seen before, that gets really exciting. It's kind of addic addictive. Now, those involved with the project are hoping to showcase the natural beauty to the rest of the world. UNESCO Global Geoparks highlight significant geological sites, and this is one of only five geoparks in Canada. 
Well, the beauty of the designation is that it immediately puts you on the world stage. So it will let us reach audiences that we could never ever reach just on our own. The area stretches 160 kilometers along the Bay of Fundy. It's a place that is also important to Indigenous history. It's closely connected to our legendary person, uh, Glooscap. There's a lot of legends about Glooscap along the Fundy Trail and along the Fund Bay of Fundy. And uh, our ancestors have been here for over 13,000 years, according to archaeological evidence. So it's very exciting for the Mi'kmaq. But there's still work left to be done. The president of the Cliffs of Fundy Geopark says the province will have to spend some money to make this a success. I've felt over the years that we're sort of been neglected, this, this area, and we have so much to offer. And as I mentioned before, we went, went to this, that we've just basically taken what Mother Nature has put here and we're showcasing it to the world. But the promise of a lucrative tourism sector is also bringing hope to communities still reeling after a gunman killed 22 people in April during one of Canada's deadliest mass shootings. Uh, we'll never forget. There's no way that we will ever forget the tragic events that have happened on April 18th and 19th. But we also don't want to be defined by those events. It's going to be a long healing process, we know that. But this is something I believe the Geopark is going forward and it's looking ahead and it's positive for our rural area. The people involved in the Geopark say they hope to have a celebration this summer as soon as it is safe to do so. Emma Davy, CBC News, Advocate Harbour. That looks gorgeous. Stunning. I would love to go and visit. We're usually back in the Maritimes in the summer. Never been there, though, so maybe not this summer, but uh, down the road. And we have a geopark uh, here in B.C., right? Yes, apparently Tumblr Ridge. Did you know that? I did not. The An I official UNESCO geopark. Official. It's, it's on the right. site. I'm looking at the laptop, and yeah. there it is. To do some more research on its unique yeah. history, for sure. Very cool. Okay, that's uh, it for us tonight. You can always watch this newscast online, cbc.ca slash bc. Our next local news is right here at 11 o'clock. I will be here after the National. Have a great weekend. See you Monday.